All right, lastly, we're going to talk a bit about inverses of linear transformations. We say that a linear transformation or a linear operator inside of um, the set of linear transformations from V to V is invertible if we can find another transformation or another operator inside of that set of linear transformations from V to V such that the compositions give us the identity operator. So when we compose T and S or S and T, it doesn't matter the order, we get the identity operator. Um, by the identity operator or the identity transformation, I just mean the linear transformation where V gets mapped to V. So each element just gets mapped to itself. So there are quite a few notes just for some clarification purposes that I want to give to you based on this definition. So if we can find this linear operator S so that the composition of S and T in either direction gives us the identity operator, we usually say that S is the inverse of T and we'll write it in with the usual notation as T inverse. I want you to understand here that the way we've defined the inverse, we don't need any extra theorems to tell us whether or not the inverse is a linear transformation. By definition, it's automatically going to be a linear transformation because we want S to be inside the set of linear transformations from V to V. The third and fourth are just properties that I want to give to you. We're not going to prove them, but you can use them uh, if you see necessary. That is that the inverse of the inverse transformation is just T. And if we have a composition of two invertible transformations, so we know that R and T are both invertible, then we can switch the order and distribute the minus one. So uh, properties three and four are very similar to what you may have seen in 1201 regarding matrix inverses. Where we are right now in the course, we're actually almost unable to find inverse transformations. So I'm going to have to ask you to be patient with me here for a couple more chapters until we get into um, matrix representations of linear transformations. We'll be able to actually physically find the inverses then. But as for right now, I want to give you a couple of theorems to help you determine whether or not a transformation or an operator might be invertible. So theorem three is a, an equivalent statement theorem. So if T is a linear operator, the following three things are equivalent. So T is invertible implies that the kernel of our linear transformation is only the zero vector, and that implies that the range of T is equal to V. So if any one of these three statements are true, then it implies the other two are true as well. This next theorem is also a useful one to know. Uh, it says that if T is a linear operator, it's going to be invertible if and only if a basis gets sent to a basis. So the idea is if you know a basis for a vector space V and we send that basis through a linear operator and we end up with a basis for V, T has to be invertible by this theorem. So this next example we're going to determine whether or not a couple of linear operators are invertible or not using those previous two theorems. So first, let's take a look at a uh, transformation from R2 to R2, and it's the projection of a vector xy onto the x-axis. So this is something that we've talked a little bit about previously before, but I just want to refresh your memory. So let's say we're given a vector here, and through this linear transformation, this vector is going to be projected onto the x-axis, orthogonally like so. So this is how T acts on every vector inside R2. Now what I want you to do is I want you to think about all of the vectors that get mapped to the zero vector. This is the kernel of our linear transformation. So do you remember which vectors got mapped to the zero vector? Well, it's any vector that lies on the y-axis here. So any vector that lies on the y-axis, when we project it onto the x-axis, we end up with the zero vector here at the origin. And 
And since we have a whole collection of vectors that get mapped to the origin, this tells us that the kernel of our linear transformation is not just the zero vector. It's actually more. It's actually a one-dimensional subspace. So since we have that the kernel of our linear transformation is not equal to the zero vector, that allows us to conclude that this particular linear transformation is not invertible. And next we're going to take a look at a linear transformation from R2 to R2 given by the following form. What we're going to do for this one is we can't really visualize what this looks like easily. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the standard basis of R2 and I'm going to map it through S and see where it goes. So remember that the standard basis is this collection here. So let's map these two vectors through S and see what happens. So what is S of 1 comma 0? Well, I put in 1 everywhere I see x. So we'll get 3 and negative 2. And S of 0, 1, we're going to put 1 everywhere we see y. So we'll have negative 1 and 1. And we want to analyze this set of vectors. So let's take a look at 3 minus 2 and negative 1 and 1. S is going to be invertible if these vectors form a basis for R2. So remember we had that theory that said if we map a basis to a basis, then our linear transformation is invertible. So is this a basis for R2? So because this only has two vectors in it, and these vectors are not scalar multiples of each other, they must be linearly independent. We know that the dimension of R2 is 2, so we have two linearly independent vectors. They must form a basis for R2 by some theory that we've seen before. So in fact, this set here is a basis for R2. And this allows us to conclude that S must be an invertible linear transformation. 